Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how's it going today? Oh, it's going so well. I'm very excited about this uh, conversation that we have with a very interesting, hilarious, peculiar, talented individual. Somebody who is the author of many macabre books, including children's horror stories, a wonderful book called Cursed Objects, and he also does macabre travel logs, which is traveling to places around the country, probably around the world that uh, are, are odd, interesting, have a darker history to them. That's right. His name is J.W. Walker. He is uh, a really interesting guy and uh, an awesome author. And we delved into his book called Cursed Objects. But yeah, you're right. He's got a ton of really interesting books, all kind of dark topics and written with a sense of humor. As you'll see in this interview, uh, it's, it's a great chat. It's a lot of fun. We have a good, we have a, a lot of laughs just talking about his book. It's not completely serious. It's uh it's a fun read. Yeah, and check out his writings and all of the work that he does on oddthingsiveseen.com. That's oddthingsiveseen.com. If you can't remember that, it just uh, breaks down to Otis, O-T-I-S. And you can check out everything that he's done. He's, again, super cool guy, and this is a really fun uh, conversation. Also, historical I, I, I want to say any one of his books, like The Cursed Objects, you get a little bit of a history lesson there that you wouldn't have gotten through, I guess, traditional channels. Very true. So check out this interview and check out his writing. You can find a link to his author page on Amazon in the show notes, as well as his website. Thank you very much for listening. We really appreciate it. And Tim, speaking of odd things, you know what's not odd to see? A five-star rating and a positive review wherever you listen and rate your podcast. So why don't you swing on over to wherever you listen to Crawl Space. Pop that old fifth star right there next to the fourth one. Welcome to the podcast, author J.W. Auker. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for joining us. First of all, I just want to, I know anyone who's listening can't see this, but we were talking before we started recording and your background, sir, is exactly how I wanted it to be. It's got this leather chair. This looks like a super comfortable leather chair, books and shelves and some posters. And then you got like a suit over there. It's exactly how I wanted it to be. Yeah, it's mostly mementos for my travels, and also a good percentage of it is my Ray Bradbury collection. So that jacket you mentioned is his his jacket. You have a Ray Bradbury jacket. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff in that corner you see is mostly his artifacts. I'm a big, big fan of his. That's amazing. That's, that's incredible. How much of his stuff is cursed? <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. I don't think any of it is. I would definitely be one of the ones to know if it was, because it's all around me right now. Well, that that's a great segue, Tim. Cursed objects is why we're uh, why we invited you on the show. Strange but true stories of the world's most infamous items. It's a it's a great read. It's also a great listen. If you get this on Audible, the narrator Tim Campbell does a great job capturing not only just the 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 rich storytelling and the history of everything, but the sense of humor. There's like this layer of sarcasm that will crack you up without expecting to. Like you won't you won't be ex expecting to laugh as much as you do yeah i'm glad you said that because uh, tim's great they uh I, I get to pick tim from a lineup <laughs> of people they offered me and um it's, it's the first time i've had any of my nonfiction read which my nonfiction is written in a very distinct voice in my voice so it's a lot of uh fragments of sentences a lot of casual words you're not supposed to be putting into print it's it's a very distinct way i talk and write so Hearing Tim perform it was one of the highlights of my author career, I think. It was so fun to hear. Yeah, he definitely understood your sense of humor right away and sort of the sarcasm behind the writing. Yeah, it's a very interesting book and extremely entertaining as well. And you kind of do it almost as someone who's stepped back from it. Like, you're not into it so much where you're like, oh, this is definitely cursed. You know, this one caused deaths. You're, you look at it as an observer and explore the possibilities that, you know, this is just maybe fun and not necessarily a deadly curse. Right, exactly. I looked at it as stories. So whether they're true stories or false stories, and all these objects have both, multiple <laughs> multiple or both, they were still stories that get circulated. So I, to me, you know, if a story lasts a certain amount of time, it legitimizes it. It doesn't mean it's true, but it's, it means it has meaning as a story. Somebody finds it meaningful. So that was how, kind of the, uh, maybe the gauze I put between me and, and the objects was just that idea of these are stories. They just, they just happen to be connected to 
cursed objects, which in a way that physical cursed object is a way to like really save stories. I've, I've learned like I always use the Hope Diamond as an example. The Hope Diamond, the, one of the last owners was Walsh. I think it was Elaine Walsh. And we wouldn't know her story at all, really, if it wasn't for the cursed diamond that she owned. Like we, it, she had a very tragic life, also a very interesting life. She was very wealthy and her story would be probably lost. But the fact that she owned the Hope Diamond and became part of the Hope Diamond story her story continues on so that somebody like me, who would otherwise not know it, now knows it, even if I am probably misremembering your name. It's been a while since I've read that chapter. But yeah, there, it's exactly the stories is what, is what gave me that kind of distance or closeness to it. It's amazing. Uh, I love stories like that. I, I love the um, the history behind these things. I love it when ghost stories are presented with more fabric to them, with more material to them, as opposed to... You know, you watch the TV shows that have the see in the dark cameras and people are running around with their, you know, the green look to it and all of these jump scares. I, I love I love the history of it and realizing something like that where you wouldn't have known someone's background that might have some importance or significance in history. And and that's what this book delivers. Yeah. The ghost story is a good is a good uh, analogy, I think, because to me. You know, ghost stories are almost more interesting when they're not true. <laughs> so if you believe if you believe in ghosts, right, and if you believe the conventional tale of ghosts, somebody dies, they come back, which is fascinating, but it's also kind of boring as a story. They just came back. <laughs> That's their story. But if it's a really mishmash of like anthropology and belief and psychology and location and all these other things mashed together, it's almost to me most of the times an even more interesting story. I love how you curse the readers of the book right at the top, um, at least anyone who stole the book, which is was was really cool. And it comes around again later in the book. And I really like that. But I was wondering, do you have any advice for anyone who stole the book and then read it? And then read the curse and realized, <laughs> oh shit, what do I do now? This is really good timing. And this sounds like I'm BSing you, but I literally had somebody text me, not, text me through Instagram. I guess it's a DM, a DM me through Instagram for the first time since this book's been out, whatever, a year and a half, and said, hey, by the way, I, I stole the book and can you please rescind the curse? I'm sure it was tongue in cheek, but it just came out and told me, I stole your book. Can you please rescind the curse? And the curse is that if you steal this book, you'll get hanged by your neck and crows will eat your eyeballs out. So that's the curse. It's a, lot, it's a little more poetic than that because it's an actual book curse used way back in the day. So I just sent her back a gif of a crow. <laughs> That's all I did. And then, you know, I started a whole conversation. So I, I mean, I don't actively encourage people to steal books, but I, I'm happy that anybody reads it. <laughs> so the context around it, I just don't tell me, just don't tell me you stole a book. The way to get around the curse, there is no way we didn't, we didn't leave any, any loop. I guess we didn't leave a path toward redemption for that. You're just cursed. You're going to die at the end of a rope with, with crow beaks in your eye sockets. <laughs> just, just prepare for it. I didn't say when, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But that's how your obituary will read. Well, it reminds me of the painting that you referenced, the the hands resist him, and we had the the actual painter of that on the show a little while ago, Bill Stoneham, and yeah, that's awesome. He's such a great guy, and he said people will email him or they'll ask him like, "Will I die after I look at the painting?" And then he says, "I'm I always tell him, yeah." <laughs> Yeah, so true. Very true. You will. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Your travels and everything that you do and your writings, they all come together on your website that is shortened to Otis, but it's odd things I've seen. Uh, can you go back and, and give us a little bit of background on, on where that started and, and what it is now? Because you have so much content there. <laughs> yeah, so it started out. Uh, so I went through a phase of my life where I was just like, it was really not not a good phase of my life. And I wanted to be a writer. I knew that already. If I was going to write about stuff, I needed to write about interesting stuff. And I knew that I wasn't at all interesting. Like not, not even like, I couldn't even lie to make myself sound interesting. There's not enough to exaggerate. So I thought about it and realized, you know, oh, what if I go see interesting stuff? And then I write about that interesting stuff. And suddenly, whatever, that's an interesting part of my life, just by, the fact, just by the fact that those things are interesting. I have an interesting part of my life. So there's that, you know, me trying to, I don't know, just try to live a little bit more than I was doing. So like this gave me an excuse to like get out of my house and go places and see things. And at the same time, it was probably fortuitous. At the same time, I wanted to do some internet writing. The weird US books, I think had just started. They were like in the early days of those, um, the uh, New Jersey guys that, was, that started that. A couple of random shows on that kind of dealt with like the weird and I always kind of liked the weird but I never really thought about it as something I could partake in so just one day I jumped in my car and drove like I don't know a couple miles away and saw something weird and then the next weekend I did the same thing a couple miles away saw something weird and eventually um and that, this, this is my travel writer story I didn't have I never had an assignment didn't whatever wasn't getting a, a stipend to do anything I just jumped in my car every weekend and drove 
anywhere between 15 minutes to six hours to go see something. And then I just started writing about those things. I took pictures. I just started about writing, you know, about the histories. At, at the very beginning, I wanted to be really easy because I was lazy. So I wanted just to be like really fast. I take I tell, I tell a history in one paragraph. I'll tell some of my first hand experience and then get out of there. But of course, weird stories usually are a lot more convoluted than that. So um, I just started doing that. And I, I thought the value I was adding, when people started actually reading it besides myself. I thought the value I was adding was just my perspective, right? So anybody can go on Wikipedia. Even in the early days of Otis, it was like 2007. A lot of stuff was online. So you go to Wikipedia anytime you want and read about anything, the weirdest thing, or find another blog. So I thought I was adding my perspective. I could actually go see the site, go see the plaque, go see the statue, and then give my perspective. Uh, but what I learned was that wasn't that valuable either. What I learned what was valuable was just kind of the example, the fact that, you know, one day I had this revelation that you could just leave your house, like everything that's happened on the planet, like anywhere, there's a physical site where it happened, which is a dumb revelation, but that was my revelation. It's, if it's on the news, if, it's, if a book is inspired by it, it exists somewhere. If it's a fact, if it's a piece of land, if it's a tree, it exists somewhere. And if it exists somewhere, you can probably go see it. So like that idea of just going out and seeing things is kind of what, it became more of a philosophy than just a way to kill time and a way to like practice my writing chops. So it's kind of become me to the point that if I stopped Otis, stopped writing about my travels, I would still do the travels. I wouldn't write about them anymore, but I would still do the travels as so much to become a part of me. So Otis over the years has kind of just evolved from that to a repository of all my adventures to now that I'm doing books and other things, it kind of, it's just become my hub. That's my life. Like so if you want to learn anything about me or find out my books, I always send people right to that website because it's, it's kind of my life. On, it's everything about me just in one easy to access place with very, very old UI. <laughs> I've never updated that site from a, from a graphic standpoint for a decade. Okay, and um, why did you choose to write the book about cursed objects? Yeah, I can't take credit for that. So this, for the first time in my life, somebody brought a topic to me. Usually it came out of my own you know, heart and head. Uh, but in this case, uh, my agent was shopping around a horror novel that I'd written, and it was in the hands of this one publisher. And they were doing their research on me like they always do. They try to figure out they want to invest money in, in some rando that sent them a manuscript. And it got it bounced around inside the publisher. And this person named Rebecca Gyllenhaal, she has been sitting on this idea for a long time. She wanted to do a cursed object book. She didn't know the form of it, the shape of it. She just thought that cursed objects would be a cool topic. So they found out that my past is just going to weird stuff. So they, she, they approached me and said, hey, is this idea interesting to you? And if so, can you put together a book proposal? So, you know, I went back and forth. I thought about it because I didn't like being, I didn't like being assigned work. Like there's a reason why there's an I in Otis. It's just, I'm very like, I, I need, it needs to, I need to be inside of it. I need like, I need to be able to go through a book project. And if I don't actually write a book about it, still be happy. Like if I had seen all the cursed objects, didn't write a book, I'd still be happy. If I went to live in Salem for a month and didn't write a book about it, I'd, I'd still get a value out of that experience. And if it was just an assignment, I thought it wouldn't be that way, but they pretty much let me go and do whatever I wanted to. And then once I found the end, once I found out that, A, this hadn't really been done before, like there was no cursed object like, compendium. There was like cursed object listicles and it was all the same 10, but there wasn't this like one source of cursed objects. And on top of that, I could... I found out how to personalize it and I was able to visit a bunch of them and just kind of make them a part of my life. It, it just was perfect. I was, the book I never would have thought of writing, but I'm so glad I did. I just fell in love with cursed objects. I fell in love with like just everything about them. And now, you know, as soon as I write a book about something, it's a permanent part of my life. Like for the rest of my life, I will like be always reading about cursed objects and trying to visit them and learning about them. Uh, it, it's just fortuitous that it was, that the idea was brought to me and, uh, but I was able to like internalize it and fell in love with it. So, I mean, the, the obvious question is, which one of these objects made you feel the most uncomfortable? Which one of them, <laughs> yeah, which one of them do you look at and you're like, yeah, I, I can I can see that. Well, I'll give you two answers to that. One is, the answer is always dolls, right? That's just, if they're cursed or not, dolls <laughs> will be creepy. It's that whole like face thing and this whole like the child childish of it and the, the imagination, the idea of giving this creepy doll to a child is always kind of unsettling. But really, and I have a pretty high tolerance for like unsettling and weird and macabre and scary, just because as a writer, I'm always hoping for something like that to happen so that my what I write about is more interesting. So I always had that filter. But I think that one place that was really unsettling was, um, and this is a, kind of a big place, uh, Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum was extremely unsettling. The way he just, so he owns, he owns the Dybbuk box, he owns a bunch of other cursed objects. Uh, he owns murderabilia. He owns haunted objects. And the way he displays them is full on haunted house. He tries to make them spooky with lighting, with darkness, with sound. Does a great job at it. It's like, it's like walking through a haunted house half the time more than a museum. But on top of that, you know, his place is stuffed full of serial killer stuff, which is highly <laughs> like bloodstains and ashes and all kinds of stuff that, you know, you 
didn't realize it was on the market. Um, but I think that place was where I was most unsettled. And the Divic box itself, even though it's actually a fraudulent cursed object, the way he lights it and the way he talks about it and the way it's in there, it's unsettling to walk around. It just it just is. Uh, he just uses all, uh, he, he attacks all five senses in his museum, which is, you know, laudable. Very cool. We might have to check that out. Tell us about some of these curses. You mentioned the Hope Diamond. Uh, that's obviously mm-hmm. a very um, sort of popular story. I don't know that I, I knew as much as I did going into listening. I mean, I'm sure I didn't. I, I knew of the Hope Diamond as a thing, but it's really fascinating to hear. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the Hope Diamond I love a lot because, A, for my hometown, so I'm from uh, the D.C. area. I'm from Maryland, all the way around Maryland, and Virginia, too. So Smithsonian was our, like, that's where we went to for class field trips. So I, I've grown up around the Hope Diamond almost. And it's the only, probably, well, one of two items in the entire book that that you can and people have written an entire book just on those things. That's how rich their histories are. That and probably King Tut's tomb are the two things in the in the book that you could write entire books on. Um, but the Hope Diamond is great because it's my, my favorite example because it's the, kind of the iconic cursed object because it's small enough to get lost, right? <laughs> that hold in your hand. It's to to wrap your mind around. It's expensive, right? It's a diamond, which means it's been in you know whatever all the places that rich stuff goes. Um, so you always think of kind of cursed treasure in that sense. And then it has a real history too. Like they're, 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 all these objects have either a physical history. This is the one that's, you know, I don't, I don't call it a legitimate history, but it's the historical history, the one you can prove and has documentation. And then there's the cursed history. So the one for the Hope Diamond is it started, you know, millions of years ago in the ground in India, got mined there, picked up by a French merchant, basically sold to a French royalty. The French royalty got their heads cut off. <laughs> and they got put in the hands of the British into Cartier's hands, the the diamond businessman who tried to sell it to Americans, to American royalty, which is, you know, businessmen and actors, business people and actors, got sold to the washes. And then the washes eventually all died or, in, <laughs> you know, died, suicide, insane asylums. So bad stuff happened to all these people that owned it, except for Cartier. He did pretty good. Uh, and then eventually got into somebody else's hands who donated it to the Smithsonian for a giant tax break. So that's the real story of it told in three seconds. But all along the way, pretty much everybody who had their hands around it suffered misfortune. And that could be death. That could be injury. That could be bankruptcy. That could be the, the loss of loved ones. Uh, all the usual misfortunes. And they're all around the Hope Diamond. Part of that is because it's been around so long, hundreds of years in human hands, stuff happens. B, it's been in wealthy people's hands, and <laughs> those people are usually messed up in all kinds of ways, even without cursed objects. So that that's happening, right? And then on on top of it all, again, I think the one that the one that's the most interesting is probably Walsh, Evelyn Walsh. I think I called her something else earlier, different E name, but Evelyn Walsh, she would do stuff like she wore it in a crown when she go to parties. She put it on her dog's collar for fun. She actually tried to pawn it at one point to fund the search for Charles Lindbergh's baby. She was a pretty good PR agent <laughs> for the Hope Diamond. And then and then the beautiful thing about, not the beautiful thing, but the, the thing that caps it all off for me, the thing that I love is, and the end of that story isn't it disappears to human history like some cursed objects do and some like, you know, fanciful tales do. It ends up in America's attic. It ends up in the most prominent museum in the country that's free and that any one of us can just walk into and see. It's right there, it's in a display case, it's rotating this display case so that everybody can see it because there's always tons of people just like clustered around it. And then and we all have access to it. So this massive story that's both historical, full of misfortune, and you can go see it with your own eyeballs, which again, if you go back to the earlier talk, that's exactly why I started Otis is so I could see things for myself. So I, I love everything about the Hope Diamond for all of those reasons. And again, but again, it is kind of the most well-known one for good reason, but still there's there's lots of elements to that story that not everybody knows. So probably one of my favorites in the book. So is it cursing everybody who sees it at the Smithsonian? That's a good question. Some people actually said <laughs> that it was actually cursing the entire country. So like you could you could almost plot <laughs> once once America owned it, right? However that works. I don't know how that works. You know, suddenly bad stuff happens in politics and bad stuff happens in nature and bad stuff happens, which is bad stuff's always happening in a country this big or any country, but a country this big for sure. But you probably could plot a lot of bad things directly after the acquisition of the Hope Diamond. But it brings up a good point for me with like there's no set rules on how cursed objects work, right? Cursed objects, in some cases, only impact the owners, people who physically own it in their possession. Some uh, impact people who just show an interest in it. There's all kinds of stories. The Unlucky Mummy, the guy who photographed, who photographed it was supposed to get, get hurt. Uh, Atsi, the Ice Mummy, out in Italy, its roll call of dead bodies are all scientists, pretty much, that just want, just want to examine it. Journalists who've never even seen a cursed object but wrote about it, they've been impacted. So... And sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's somebody you love. Sometimes it's just financial ruin. Sometimes it's death. Sometimes it's injury. It, it's really, I guess it adds to the scariness of the object. It's just really random in how that happens. So very plausibly, you could go see the Hope Diamond 
just seeing it, just being six inches away from it could be enough to, you know, take you down a bad path. So interesting. The the history and, and, you know, you think about all the circumstances that surround where we're at as a, like, society or, you know, back then, you know, what was going on? And, and you mentioned rich people have an abundance of problems anyway, just throw on some <laughs> allegedly cursed item. You know, yeah. that's probably not what's doing it. It's probably all of the other issues that they've just brought on themselves <laughs> just because of their lack of wherewithal, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing about that, and I don't, I don't know if I ever put this together in my head till just now to hear you talk is that the human condition is inherently cursed, right? We're all kind of falling apart every second. We're all constantly stressed. No matter what era you live in, you're stressed. There's always problems. You're always like just hacking your way through whatever life throws at you. So the, <laughs> the human condition is inherently cursed, which I guess is kind of biblical, I guess. I didn't mean to go that way, but it sounds biblical. But the, the, human, uh, <laughs> okay. if the human condition is cursed, then, you know, it's fun to blame random objects on it instead of our own selves. You put it much better than I did. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say, the human condition. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. And uh, you mentioned the Iceman and how that is covered in your book. So would you suggest we cover that on the podcast? We were, we were considering it at one point, just, you know, the mystery, but uh, maybe maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> well, I had to face that exact same conundrum when I write writing the book, right? And like, oh, I'm, and Otzi particularly... Um, one of his one of his victims was a journalist that was just writing a piece about them. So it, it's a good point, though. I always talk about it in terms of myself uh, having to like make that decision. But really, anybody interviewing me should really look deep <laughs> into their own lives and risk tolerances before they talk to me. It's a really good point. I'm glad you did. <laughs> oh, Tim, Tim's gone. Oh, he's back. Shit, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you acquired this bulldog, right? This yeah. little. Okay. Do you have that lying around somewhere? And what's the status with this? I don't, know. I don't know if you guys are watching this, but it's literally right behind my head on the shelf of all my travel kind of tchotchkes I picked up over the years. But yeah, so this is part I was talking about earlier where I said, you know, if, I, if I'm going to write this book, it really needs to be me in this. I need to be in this book. Like The word I is the most used word I use for any of my nonfiction. Because uh, again, I, I value the experience almost more than I do writing about it. I want to have the experience. So I knew if I was going to do a book about cursed objects, I would visit a bunch of famous ones, and they're all really easy to visit. Most of them are easy to visit because they're all in museums. But um, I had to have one in my house. I had to experience like what it was like to buy one, what it was like to have it in your house. I needed to be able to look at it while I was writing about the deaths of journalists due to like being interested in cursed objects while it stared at me with its little eyes. I just had to do it. It felt like if I didn't do that, it'd be a giant hole in the book, which is not true, right? Nobody would have known. Nobody would have cared if I didn't buy a cursed object, but I would have known. I'm like, man, that's this is my one opportunity to buy a cursed object in a way that uh, you know, whatever makes sense. You know, I can buy a cursed object anytime, I guess, but for the book and to write about it and to give it like a life beyond just sitting on my shelf, uh, I had to do it. Uh, so I don't know, do you mean, I know my, all my answers are pretty long winded. So I don't know, do you mean tell the story or is it just good enough to know that I have a cursed object in my hand that by the way, both of you guys are looking at right now. Please tell the uh, story. Yeah, please share. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the, one of the book, one of the sections of the book is about the business of cursed objects, right? Cause I, at some point you get tired of talking about like dusty things, like you know, it's a chest and it's a chair and it's all these things. So I want to talk about the people that collected it because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of haunted museums out there. Uh, more than, more than you, you, you guys probably know actually, but there's a lot out there. And it's always, it's always fascinating to me that, you know, the people will bring all these things in, like the whole draw of these things that are haunted, that are dangerous, that are cursed. And then these museum people fill their houses with them. I do, I do defend that a bit. I say, you know, that's the same thing with the zoo, right? The zoo is full of dangerous animals, but doesn't mean you don't have a zoo. But still, it's fascinating that you go to sleep and it'd be like a cursed painting, you know, above, you know, whatever the next room. So I wanted to get a cursed object and put it in, in my house. So I, anyway, I did a bunch of articles around those museums, but then I had to like not be a hypocrite. I had to go do it myself. So I looked at eBay. That's where you buy cursed objects these days. There's a thriving trade of cursed objects on good old eBay. And you know, whatever, I, tons on there. Lots of dolls, of course, always dolls. But I had very, very specific criteria that I had to follow by. One is it couldn't be expensive. And those things get expensive. Some of them are hundreds and hundreds of dollars, some four, four digits to buy a cursed object. So it, had to be, it couldn't blow my advance to buy this thing. It had to be not disgusting. Like I wanted this thing on my travel shelf. So it had to be something that wasn't like a doll or, or something like you know, whatever, no liquids, no, nothing like that. And then it had to be, it had to be small, right? It had to be something that if I put my, it wouldn't take over my study. I wanted it to be like on a shelf. So those are my criteria. And it took me a while to find that, honestly, to get all three of those. And I always tell people what happened was when I would search on eBay, then leave, I would get targeted ads <laughs> from eBay, which, you know, you, you see those all the time when you try to shop for a lamp or even you buy a lamp, whatever. The, the next internet site you're on, there's advertisements for a lamp right there in front of your face. 
So in this case, the ads were, it was cursed objects on eBay. We have cursed objects. So obviously it was like one of those like fill in the blanks kind of uh, algorithms where whatever you looked at, they just filled in the blanks. But in this case, I was being chased from the internet from eBay trying to get me to buy a cursed object. So I eventually did. I found the perfect one. I thought it was this little bulldog, uh, about whatever, three inches long, looks like a heavy, looks like a paperweight. So I bought it. Uh, I was the only bidder. It was like 11 bucks plus shipping, uh, including shipping and handling. So very, very economical. And the person who sold it to me told the story on the entry that her father had bought it in China like, against the owner's wishes, I think. I might, I might be mixing it up with the beginning of Gremlins because that's how Gremlins starts too. But bought it and then brought it over to the, their family. And their family said nothing but bad luck, to, bad luck since then. Financial ruin, deaths, general depressions, all, all these things that, that cursed objects do. And she wanted to get rid of it. So I did. I bought it. Second I bought it, she sent me another email saying, doesn't say congratulations. It just said, okay, hope you get what you wish for. It's coming at you. I just need to cleanse my house first. Then I got it two days later, really good shipping. She had you know, positive five stars all over her, her, her selling rank. Came right away. And all over the box, she'd written all these warnings in pink ink. I, I think I still have the box here somewhere. It said, hey, you know, be careful. What, hope you get what you wish for. Use it on your exes. What, what, I, there's all these like things you can do with cursed objects. So I started getting scared. This is the, this is the time, I, besides, besides Bagans' museum, I, for the, whatever, maybe 10th time in this book, I said, what am I doing? Is it, should I be doing this? I'm bringing what's basically, a, what somebody thinks is a cursed object into my house. And even if I don't believe in cursed objects, that doesn't mean I'm right. <laughs> what if I'm wrong and I'm taking this unnecessary risk? I have three kids, I got a wife. What if I'm taking this unnecessary risk? And then what I realized, what got me, got me through that, besides just sheer, like, whatever, need, need to do it, you know, perverse need to do it is that what I was buying wasn't really a cursed object, I, I hoped. <laughs> what I was buying was the experience of buying a cursed object, right? So if you want a cursed object in the movies and the stories and gremlins, like I said, you go to Chinatown, you go find the antique store, you go in there and it's piled full of stuff, right? And the, the owner doesn't want to sell you any of it. Everything you point to, they're like, no, 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 I can't sell you that. And you're like, but this is a shop. There's a price tag on it. Why can't I buy it? No, 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 you can't have that. Uh, same thing with like Valentino's ring. The guy who sold it to them was like, I, I, I don't want to sell that to you. Then why is it on display? <laughs> it's got a price tag on it. You definitely want to sell it to me. So anyway, you can't have that experience anymore. It's shopping experience is just buy apps. I can click and it's in your pocket. And that's not a fun way to buy a haunted doll. It's not a fun way to buy something spooky. It's not a, it's a fun way to, it's, it's not fun. So she was giving me this experience of like this unease experience of buying a cursed object, I think. Or I should say, I think in hindsight, now that I'm not dead, <laughs> I think that's what it was in hindsight. But then I took the, I took that dog and I put it on my desk and I wrote chapters of the book while it was staring at me. Um, nothing bad happened. It was a really good year. I, so, I, so I upped the ante and I took it with me on vacation. I uh, mean, my family flew to St. Augustine's, Florida, ostensibly to vacation, but really there was a cursed object there I wanted to go see. So I kind of like, you know, whatever, combined the vacation budget <laughs> with, the, with the advance a little bit. And down there, I had a good time, saw a lot of cool stuff, a really good year for me. So nothing bad's happened. I mean, obviously since then bad things have happened. I mean, I, again, the human condition, but nothing so insistent and so frequent and so pointed that I would ever think uh, it, was, it was this dog that did it, which, you know, that's the danger of cursed objects, right? You, it, because any object can be cursed. You know, if you go through a bad time in your life, you don't, you don't suspect things like brass dogs and ottomans and whatever desks, that those are the cursed objects. You never think about that, which is why they're so insidious. It's always a little they think they can damage your life and you have no idea. So that's it. Either I, got, either I got a bum, I got a bum cursed object, or I just got a nice dog, which I like, by the way. One of the, two, two of the, one of the good things I liked about it was there's no identifying marks on it, which would have been a real bummer if it was like copyright 2020 or, you know, made in Taiwan. You know, that would take some of the mystery out of it. <laughs> um, and then I named it because any like self-respecting cursed object has right. a cool name. And that name always sounds like the title of a Sherlock Holmes story. So I named it the Cursed Cur. So it sounds like you know Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Cursed Cur, just to give it some kind of like you know, not to make it feel bad for not giving me, <laughs> giving me misfortunes and death. So that's it. That's my cursed object, uh, which I wrote about, and because it's not a famous cursed object, my illustrator didn't illustrate that one. Uh, unfortunately, I would love for that. But then the French version came out a few months ago, and they went and they found an illustration of a, of a bulldog and put it in the book because they used they used real pictures in the book and the French version. So I really I I took this dog from somebody's tchotchke shelf to my house now it adorns a page of a book in france so i kind of like that little journey for the uh, cursed cur and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program 
had you chosen to go to Hawaii instead and bring the cursed object there and go go surfing like on the Brady Bunch, I think you definitely. Uh, I was hoping this was a Brady reference. <laughs> Yeah, I could have hung out with Vincent Price, get a tarantula in my, my shoes. I, 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 that's probably not a bad idea. That would have been a better article if I had done that. A rare Brady Bunch reference on Crawl Space. Wow. Yeah, I had, to, I had to dig back a little bit for that. Wow. Good for you. Maybe that bulldog just sort of worked itself out with the other woman. Maybe all of that bad, like, juju was, like, worked out with the other woman and, you know, and came to your lovely office there and was like, this is great. The other more hideous theory is that she picked the wrong cursed object. It's something else on her shelf that's causing her family all of that, all that trouble. <laughs> I mean, who's to say it didn't uh, curse the postal worker who first uh, handled it, you know? Yeah, it's, they're devious as cursed objects. They re- and that's, that's another thing. If they were as regular as a gun, right? Every time you shot a gun six inches away from a person's head, you'll kill them, right? Well, whatever. 99 times out of 100, you'll kill them. Cursed objects are not that predictable. They are so unpredictable, it makes them almost, not even more dangerous, because killing every time is da- more dangerous, but it makes them more scary. Almost like a hot potato game where you just kind of throw it around and at some point, <laughs> somebody gets cursed. So it's, it's, again, another fascinating part of that story. And uh, you you mentioned that you uh, lived in Salem for a month, and uh, that was the subject of your book, Season with the Witch. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And obviously, you picked Salem for a reason. When, when did you pull the trigger on that one? That So that one, so I've been visiting Salem since before I moved to New England. It's, it's been over maybe 14, 15 years I visited Salem every year. These days, multiple times a year because it's only 40 minutes away from me. But I had just gotten done Poland. And this is the beginning of my career where I was doing a book every two years. I was doing a lot of traveling for the book. I'd write it and then I would just pass out for like six months or whatever. So I just finished Poland, which I traveled to eight states and across the ocean to find all the sites that Poe lived and anything that still survived from him and all the memorials to him. And I was like, oh, I'm now, it's my third book. I've, <laughs> I've made myself a travel writer somehow, which means I have to travel and it's exhausting. How can I do a travel writing book and not go anywhere? Is that possible? Is that a thing? So I just remember one day laying in bed and just it hit me. I was like, oh, I could do Poland, but instead of it being about a person, I can do it about a town and just stay in that town. So I remember just laying there one day and saying, and my wife comes into the room and I said, hey, what would you think about moving to Salem for all of October? <laughs> she just, she loves Salem too. She just looked at me like, that sounds absolutely bizarre. Why would we do that? And that's kind of how it launched. I was like, oh, I can literally just live in this town, walk outside my door. Like the farthest I traveled for <laughs> Season with the Witch is probably half an hour. And just see just as many wonders as a trip, as a book that takes me around the world. And in a way that, you know, it hasn't, hadn't been done yet. I wanted to document everything about that city. It wasn't totally about the witch trials. It wasn't a history book. It was about this weird city that's weird. And one of the reasons it's weird is because of the witch trials. Not even all the reasons, but one of the reasons is the witch trials. So, you know, I got to do that. And I don't know, I I love the city. I came away from, again, just like loving Cursed Objects, coming away from that book. I came away from Salem, which I already thought I loved, loving it even more. It's just such a unique city. And I couldn't have written a book like that about very many cities, you know, not and not it not it come out as as conflicted and weird and unique again salem's unlike any city of the planet so that's kind of the, that's the whole story behind it you know and i love halloween i'm a big halloween junkie so that's also kind of a it's one of those dreams i had in my head that i would never fulfill right it's like oh go to salem on halloween during the chaos of halloween night uh, and I, I just never would have done that ordinarily but with the book and by the fact that I was already in a house in the middle of the city you know <laughs> when halloween started it all made that possible as well so it, it's i I tell people that's probably the most me book as far as my nonfiction goes. If you want to know more about my interests and the stuff I like, say A Season with the Witch is definitely the one that has like, you know, all of my, you know, whatever heart and arteries and blood in it. Very cool. Um, And you mentioned Halloween. You said you're a big Halloween junkie. You celebrate Halloween for two months. I do. I do. And the reason I do that is because, so there's three, there's three types, well, four types of people, right? There's when it comes to Halloween, people that don't celebrate Halloween, which was me for a long time, by the way. Uh, for religious reasons. And then there's people that celebrate Halloween on Halloween, when you're supposed to celebrate it. It's a day of the year. Then there's people that kind of um, celebrate it for all of October, right? They, they generally, right? They, they, they mix it with fall. And then there's more, then there's, no, there's people that celebrate it year round. There's those people that like just, it's Halloween is a lifestyle for them. And I don't mean like goths and people that like the dark aesthetic. Halloween itself is a lifestyle for them. For me, um, those two months, that gives me enough time to do everything I want to do. All the road trips, all of the visits, all the traditions. I have so many now that I can never fit them into one week, one weekend or one week or two weeks. 
you know, and, you know, work a job and, <laughs> and you know, do all this, you know, whatever, keep the lights on, that kind of thing. So it gives me enough time for that. And, but it also gives me the excuse to just wallow in this like time of the year that I love that does end November 1st, as much as I love Halloween, me and my wife are just tearing everything down. We hate it. It's like, it's like, it's just, it almost disgusts us on November 1st. Just like Halloween's over. This is perverse. Get it out of here. You know, it's a bit, uh, it, not to get crude, but it's almost like the, the one night stand where like that night you're way into it. Not, not me, not you guys, but somebody's way into it. But the next day you're like, ah, what? That's the least thing I want in the world. So that's, that's, that's what's Halloween. It, Halloween. It's long enough for me that I can indulge it, but short enough that I'm not, short enough that I can miss it again. That in another, in another six months, I'll be like, oh, I can't wait for Halloween. Uh, another seven months I can't wait for Halloween. So it's all those things. And it's it's everything I like. It's the right temperatures that I like. I love the feel of Halloween. I love the feel of fall and harvest. I love monsters on my cookie packaging or whatever I see in the grocery store. I love Halloween uh, horror movies on every channel. I love like people people that I know that aren't into the macabre or dark or, or monsters getting into it. So suddenly we're all into the same thing, the things that I'm into year round. So it's just a great time of year for me. I love it to death. I always say, you know, between that and Christmas, I love whatever whatever holiday I'm in. So right now I'm 100% Christmas, 100% Christmas. But these, the older I get, the more Halloween I get for some reason, I don't know what it is, but Christmas has a lot of obligations to it that Halloween doesn't. So, you know, the older I get and the more like whatever crotchety I get around obligations, the more Halloween is my like safe zone where like, it's just, what, <laughs> nice, nice, yeah, yeah, nice background. So that's my oldest daughter. She hand handmade that costume, painted that mask, did everything. And that was the COVID Halloween too. That was a very weird one, very first COVID Halloween. Wow, this has cool. become a very visual podcast, so I apologize. <laughs> right now, you can you can check out this picture that I put up on my virtual background on oddthingsiveseen.com. If you go to uh, your Halloween link and scroll down a little bit, you'll see it. And it, this is your daughter. It's a completely terrifying costume. Yeah, she did great. In fact, she was so bummed. She was so bummed. It was COVID Halloween, meaning it was very short. People were like putting candy on tables really far away from their houses. It wasn't real. There's was snow on the ground. You can see that picture. It snowed that morning. Uh, it was cold. It was just not a fun time. <laughs> and she spent all this time on her. So we had to take pictures. I think we took her out to the grocery store for that. So she could walk around the grocery store and people could see her costume. But she's really good, good about that. She's That's the one element of Halloween that I'm kind of not good at and don't totally, I'm not totally comfortable with is costumes on me at least. But like she's 100% into it and I love seeing it, even if I'm like walking beside her and like whatever, a turtleneck and a flat cap <laughs> instead of in a costume. Now, I went to school for uh, acting years ago and hearing, first hearing about the curse of Macbeth was something that stuck with me all these years. Um, I never experienced it. Uh, it was sort of just fun. Can you tell us a little bit about the curse of Macbeth and I guess Shakespeare's bones? Yeah, yeah. And these are, this is what, Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's grave I've seen, that's one, one of the places I've seen even before I wrote the book, it was, I'd already seen it. So Shakespeare is buried in a very, you know, it's a very tourist attraction these days. It's a very old feeling cemetery and church. He's actually inside the church, he's not in the cemetery, but the whole thing feels very old and very hammer, hammer horror film, right? That's how it feels. And then you go in there and it's like, there's like a little monument to him, but his grave is really just a, like a rock or something. It's like a uh, rock with engraving. And on that, on that rock, it says, I can't remember, I can't quote it to you, but it's basically a curse to anybody who moves his bones, you know, don't move my bones or you get cursed. And they say the reason why he did that is practical reasons, right? He was this famous guy. And of course, you know, who wouldn't want to steal the bones of a famous guy? Why, why not? Uh, so it was that part of it. And then, and, and the, the British people are so, have so been so like uh, slavish to the, that idea that they will not move it. So at one point they had to like do reconstruction. They wouldn't move the bones. At one point they wanted to actually like see what's down there. So they did. They made sure they uh, that the the scanning systems didn't disturb any dirt. So they've been really very careful not to to obey the bard's wishes. But yeah, it's only the only curse around him is that is Macbeth, right? So the idea being that if you are in Macbeth, you should never say the word Macbeth. <laughs> you're not allowed to say the name of the play while you're actually. I can't remember, and probably varies knowing curse stories. But where, where, while you're cast in the play, or while you're in the theater where it's going to be performed, and so. If you say it, just bad stuff is supposed to happen to you. I don't know why. I don't know what this is. I know actors are usually, in general, pretty superstitious, like ball players, but um, you're not allowed to do it. But there are ways to remedy that. Unlike my curse book, there are ways to remedy that curse, and it's you know again it varies a little bit, but it, it has to do with like running out and turning around three three times, kissing something. I remember there's kissing something involved, so that you can say it. But then again, if you slip and say Macbeth, <laughs> as opposed to the play or 
the the whatever they have a couple they have a lot of euphemisms for Macbeth in, in the uh, theater world. But yeah, it's, it's funny that it's, as, again calling it, it they call it a cursed play, but really what the curse is is that word. You can't say that word in that in that condition. The play itself, the, whatever the pages, the, the the original text, whatever aren't cursed. It's just that word, and only for those that certain group of people that act. So again, a very very specific cursed object. But I'm glad you brought it up, though, because if it is just a word that's cursed, it shows the wide definition of object, which I try to do in the book as well by including digital objects and that kinds of things. But again, a word, even though it's ephemeral, it's still an object. And um, if it's an object, it can be cursed. And is there is there any place or any object, any odd place that you haven't been? Is, like, I assume you have a, a bucket list of places that you haven't been yet. Totally. Um, in fact, I so I have, a, I have my own private map that I, I share with. I have like a Patreon club that I share with. But... I have this private map, and it has about 4,000 pens just in the U.S. Uh, or I should say North America, because there's some Canadian pens. Just in the U.S., 4,000 pens. I've been to about 2,000 of the pens, but all over. So, so there's places I want to go. So any, anytime I'm driving somewhere, I just call up the app, and I say, is there anything near me? And I can go to it. But the places I really, really want to go, that's that's a good, good question. The object I want to see the most, it's always been this way. I don't know why, well, I know why, but I've always wanted to see the skeleton of the elephant man, uh, Joseph Carey Merrick. I got I got interested in, story, in his story years before before Otis was even a thing. I was like reading books about him, the David Lynch play. You can't see it, but like the the poster for or David Lynch movie. I have a poster of the David Lynch movie right beside it that has like the iconic black and white with the the sack on his head. And I just found his story fascinating in every possible way. Like you could you could wrap all of human existence and suffering and joy and everything just in in his story, right? So his his bones are still. Around, it's at the College of Surgeons in London, but they don't show them to you. You're not allowed to see them. They're like in this, like, I've, I've seen one, like, snuck picture of it. It's like this dusty cabinet in the back. They do, however, have a recreation of the bones, a casting of the bones. They have this, like, tiny little museum outside of it that literally is like a room. And they have a casting of that. I think they have some, like, Jack the Ripper stuff um, as well, because it's all in that same area, Whitechapel and stuff. So I would love to see the actual bones. I, and again, I've always, I, it's always what I've always asked. Anybody, everybody, everybody's asked me that question. I'm like, yeah, I want to see the bones of Joseph Carey Merrick to the point that I don't even really understand why I want to see them anymore. <laughs> like, like it's been, it's, I'm obsessed with the story. It all comes down to story, obviously, but obsessed with the story. But all these years learning about all new things, and there's always new oddities coming up and up and up that it's still there, though. It's like my, my beacon, partly because I know I'll never see it. So I'm okay with like putting it out there as parts of like something, something like if I told you, like the Villaskaya Axe Museum, right? The house where all those people were axed. You'd be like, dude, just go to it. <laughs> it's in Illinois. Just take a plane and go see it. What's, what's holding you up? So I have to pick something exotic and something I can never, ever touch, <laughs> never, ever see in a million years. But everything, like I used to do I even ha- I used to have a top 10 list a long time ago, but I don't have it anymore. Um, so I knocked a bunch of stuff off it. Stuff like I wanted to see a corpse flower in bloom. Finally got to see that a few years ago, actually here in New Hampshire for, for somehow. Uh, I wanted to see, you, you know, uh, I wanted to see a crypt in Rome with like bodies. I saw the Capuchin crypt finally. There's one in Mexico that I really want to see. Actually, it's the one, um, I, the name escapes me, but it's the one Ray Bradbury visited and wrote about a couple of times. He wrote about it in a short story. He wrote about it as part of the Halloween tree book. He went down there and, and got to see it. And he got to see it like a long time ago when it was a lot probably freakier than it is now. So there's, a, there's, a, there's that Mexican crypt I want to see. The, the uh, Bone Church in Prague was something that was on that list. And I finally got to see it somehow. I don't even know. It was like a random lucky, lucky I just happened to be hours away from it, but it was a r- random roll of the dice. I want to see Frankenstein's castle. I want to see Dracula's castle. I haven't seen any of those two things. That kind of stuff. If it's if it's monstrous, macabre, and is has like age to it, it's, it's, it's right up my alley. Have you stayed at the Lizzie Borden house in Fall River? Yes, I did. It was one of, the first thing, one of the first things I did. Actually, before I even moved to New England, I did it. I was... My my wife was just my girlfriend at the well, my wife was my girlfriend at the time, and uh, that was one of the first places I took her. We stayed the night there. It was um it was it was <laughs> it's it was very interesting. I, I'm so glad I did. I want to do it again at some point. It just got sold, I think, to a, a spooky place conglomerate. It's like a place that just buys up spooky places across the country and turns them into tourist attractions. But it was so, such a good experience. Like you go in there, and I think I wrote about it in, in notice, but like really far back. You have to go back to like 2007, 2008 to read that article. But we got we got her room, her Lizzie Borden's actual room. That's where we slept in it. We wanted to get the room where like uh, Andrew Borden was axed because like it happened right not Andrew but um his wife was axed, which happened right beside the bed. Somebody had already taken that, so we got her her actual room. And um, honestly, it, it wasn't that spooky, but that was my fault because I was exhausted because it was a giant road trip we were on. It was like stop number not it's, it's night number four, and I had five more nights to go. 
but I, I loved it. I had a blast. They, they get, gave you the run of the house. I mean, obviously, you, there's other people in all the other rooms, so you have to be somewhat respectful. But like, gave you the run of the house. I think we did a seance there. Um, my wife uh, put on <laughs> one of the dresses <laughs> that they had on the dummy there, just so we could say we did that. Um, no, it's one of my it's one of my favorite memories. Uh, anytime that somebody just says Lizzie Borden, I don't think of the actual crime and the acts and all that stuff. I just think of that fun night we had <laughs> inside the house, hanging out and doing stuff like that. So you would recommend it. Oh, I totally recommend it. I mean, there's a there's a price point above which I wouldn't recommend it probably, but if if you can go and, and immerse yourself in the hi history, right? Re get to know the story really well. Watch, you know, whatever. If you, watch the um, the any movies that there are about it. I think there's one with um, the one from Elizabeth Montgomery did a movie. Um, there's that series with uh, Christina Ricci. Watch that stuff. Get really steep. Steep yourself. Like really set yourself up to be terrified, and then you know. Think about it. That's the thing. You, you think about it. Like if you don't think about it, it's very much like a, you just stayed the night in a B and B, right? You can definitely put it out of your put out of your brain uh, and just pick. I'm just at a B and B. I'm, that means I share a bathroom. That means I'm really close to strangers. All these things. But if you can really focus on literally a murder happened here, the person who did it is probably sleeping here. It, it it's it's one of those things where, and this is why I like physical objects. This is why I love them so much because it grounds you in time and space. Like you can tell me the story of Lizzie Borden. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting story. The second you put me in the steps of Lizzie Borden and in the body print of her of whoever's victims it was um it makes it more real and suddenly the world gets a little bit more real that's always my problem is like the world is just kind of blurry to me it makes it more real and it, it like opens your world a little bit more a little bit more and then it, it becomes a stranger world and a stranger world and that's really kind of the overall goal of it yeah I would say do it um definitely don't mortgage your house I don't know what they're charging these days but um it's definitely worth worth going to do for one night how do you think you had a seance there? Like how many, how many places have you had a seance at and you, <laughs> and you're not sure if it was there maybe or somewhere else? Actually, actually not many. I, I that's probably just a phrase <laughs> I use to avoid demonstrative sentences <laughs> so I can roll them back in case I was wrong. I definitely had a seance there. I can't roll that back anymore. Definitely had a seance there. It was probably, I think it was, I did it again. It was definitely my first seance I've ever had was right there. I think since I did it again, see, I'm such a coward. Since then, <laughs> I've never had another seance. I've done Ouija boards. I did a, lots of spiritualist readings and witches doing my fortune and stuff. But that, I think it's, again, that is the only time, ah, now that might not be true, probably the only time I've had a seance. And it was not, not great, that seance. <laughs> it was very hot and very creaky. And I was tired. I just wanted to explore Lizzie Borden's house. So but people came. I mean, ghosts came. I guess that's, that's what the that's what the uh, person who's running it said. <laughs> so it's very like in the movies. In the movies, when people fake seances, it's very interesting, right? It's like projectors and winds blowing curtains and like. But in real life, all it is is like the table knocking. <laughs> it's, it's what it's what it is, you know. It's, it's, so it's a little bit of a letdown. It reminds me of the story. It's when I was in Salem and I was interviewing all these witches and I, I was making them read my palm and do crystals. Any kind of any kind of ritual they would let me do with them, I I did. But I couldn't find anybody doing a crystal ball. I'm like, man, this is classic fortune teller stuff. Why can't I find anybody doing crystal ball? So I talked to this one witch, and she said, well, it's because it's boring. <laughs> You're both looking into this glass object that's empty, and I'm telling you things that you can't see, and it's just not – it's boring. And most of the time, people want to do this kind of stuff because they want to show. It's not just they believe sincerely, but they also just want it to be an experience. And gazing into a piece of crystal is not an experience. Getting your palm read is an experience. Uh, throwing crystals onto a table is an experience. The tarot is an experience, but like a crystal ball is just not an experience. And that's kind of how seances are uh, in real life, I found. In your travels in Salem, Massachusetts, did you run into a witch known as uh, Lori Bruno? I did, I did. Yeah, Lori, Lori Bruno did an interview. She, I think she runs, uh, uh, the name of me. it's very prominent. It's right on Ma Magica? Um, Essex Street. Magica, that's it. Yeah, so I... Again, I'm going to my records. I'm pretty sure I interviewed her. Bruno sounds extremely familiar. Are they? Is she a friend? Yeah, we had her on the show. Um, we actually did a live show with her years ago. I don't. I and I don't have any proof of this at this point. But she she told me that I was going to be hosting a radio show. She was like a radio show. I don't know about creepy things, and it's going to scare people. And that it was ama It's amazing. I can't like. That's the one thing I can say about like uh, a psychic. You know, visiting a psychic personally. That like absolutely nailed it from a mile away and i have no idea how she didn't even know like the word podcast wasn't even a thing at the time <laughs> that she said that to me yeah i think of the 12 readings i had i think I had about 12 in salem one of only one of them was close and it was like scary close and i remember that i don't remember her name which is which is sad but she's the one that did the 
the crystal reading where I thought I was coming in for a crystal ball reading, but it actually was crystals, meaning she had various various different crystals or different shapes, colors, and she just put them in a bag and kind of rolled them out and read them. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it ran the gamut. I had one that did a tarot with me that told me I should get work done on my house. They think it's a good time to get work done on your house. And then we just got to talking because I'm always in interview mode, even over my seance or even over my readings, I'm, I'm just interviewing them. For no, for no reason and it turns out he was an ex-contractor so, so it was like he was, it was pushing me in a direction he was very it's familiar like, with yeah, so it runs again these people yeah the, <laughs> it was, the last name is just a coincidence is not my brother <laughs> yeah. he comes into the wig and hat you know yeah totally <laughs> i was really fascinated by the technology chapter where the cell phone number was cursed and emails yes. could you uh, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, the cell phone number yeah so this is an interesting one and it's a cell phone number that the first i'm going to say three owners all died as re- all died that on this it's a very it's a very um unique number i can't remember because it's it's all the single digits either all nines or all sevens every single phone number that's all one digit is cursed in some country and this one i think was all nines maybe maybe it was all nines but the first person that owned it, it's a Bulgarian telecom that owns the number. And the owner of that telecom was the first person to have it. So obviously he got something he thought it was easy to have. He, he has, you know, whatever. He's like, I can have whatever number I want. I'll get with something easy. So the same repeating digit over and over again. He ended up dying of cancer. The next person ended up being gunned down in a restaurant. <laughs> Turns out he was a mafioso. Third person to get it, also gunned down. Uh, and he was a, I can't remember his, his, his occupation. It was something very pedantic, something very not mafia. But then they dug deeper. It turns out he was also a drug runner. So the first three people, the first one was cancer, second two were gunned down. So eventually the, the, the rumor is that that number was shut down because whoever had it was constantly dying. Um, obviously, there's a lot, of, a lot of problems with the story. All three of those deaths are actually factual. They're real deaths. I, I definitely verified that. But the number is still in circulation. And the person that has it, is, I think somebody did a deep dive to find out who actually has it. And the person that has it is constantly getting calls. From from people that are interested in knowing who has this cursed number, and if you go on YouTube, there's all these there's all these videos of people of you know whatever content creators calling this number, and it always it's never connecting because they don't know how to do country codes. Everybody's bad at country codes these days, so it's never connecting, and it's just like this moment of like agonizing where like they type in the digits nine digits, and then they just wait there and they wait and wait and wait, terrified that it'll it'll pick up. When the when the story isn't that if you call the number you'll die, <laughs> the story is if you own the number. You'll get gunned down. Well, you'll join the mafia first, and then you'll get gunned down. Is is the whole curse of that one? So, but I love the idea that, especially these days, that digital objects can be cursed because for a couple of reasons. One, it, we we live in a world of digital objects now, right? Um, I'm literally paying for digital clothes for my kids. They want something in these games they play, and I'm literally buying. It's costing me money. These these pixels and and lines of code is costing me money. And you know the things we own, like our apps, those are objects. You know, the, we can't get by without our apps. Those are objects, and What's scary about it is that you can stay away from antique stores and flea shops. You can stay away from anywhere where you think a cursed object can come from, but you can't stay away from online. Just It is at you at all times. And one of the stories is, uh, is a, a cursed pop-up, which I don't, I don't know if I was, I don't know if I, I actually wasn't allowed to include it in the book. I wrote about it for the website instead because it was like a pretty violent one. But it's a pop-up that just pops up on your computer. And if it does, you die within 24 hours. It's called the Red Room. Or, and and the red is your blood painting the walls of the room. So it just pops up on your computer. You're doing whatever. You're not even in the dark web. You're not even doing bad things. You're just whatever on a podcast, on Zoom. You're whatever, looking at Wikipedia. Bam, it pops up and you have 24 hours to live from that point on. So it's almost, they're almost more insidious if they're digital objects. You can't get away from it. And really that's the idea of viruses, right? Especially back in the day, you didn't know you couldn't click on a link. You didn't want to look at a download. If it was, <laughs> if it was a PDF file, you had to stay away from it because the, just the simple fact of touching a link would just destroy your entire online life. So the, the parallels with, with real life cursed objects or real world cursed objects, to me are just, it's just fascinating. And the more and more digital we get, if we ever all do into the metaverse, there's gonna be cursed objects in the metaverse for sure. I saw the other day that you can get buried in the metaverse. So you definitely can get cursed there. Interesting. Well, you mentioned at the very end of the book about the nocebo and the nocebo effect. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is, I, the way I always set this up to be dramatic is that, you know, I started this book not believing in cursed objects and I ended this book believing in cursed objects. And the reason why is because science kinds of, kind of believes in cursed objects. <laughs> um, so we all know about the placebo. The placebo is that, you know, that effect where uh, a doctor can give you a sugar pill 
and tell you it's going to it's going to cure your headache and it'll cure your headache. The body, for some reason, has this talent that it can cure it. It can heal itself on the merest provocation. Um, it can just it just it can just do that. We know that it's a scientific fact. We don't understand it at all, but it is a fact. It can, but it also also crazy about the placebo is they can give you a placebo, not tell you it's a placebo, and it can still work. So somehow, again, that information is transmitted to your body, and your body tricks itself into healing itself. So the placebo is super mysterious, but one of the you know fundamental tenets of all you know pharmaco biology, right? The the the, uh, the COVID virus, the COVID vaccine, right? There was placebos happening in the in the making of that. That's how important it is to to science. Um, but the thing is, you know, there's always an opposite. I always tell people, there's, whatever it is, whatever, whatever, there's a, whatever there's a thing, there's an opposite of that thing. And because there's a placebo, another doctor, because another doctor posited that there's a nocebo. Now, the nocebo is a doctor can come to you with a pill and tell you this pill is, has side effects. You know, it, it, it's going to make you hallucinate. You're going to have headaches. You're going to feel pain in your bones and give you a sugar pill. And then you'll, your body can convince itself to have all of those side effects. So not only, not only can the body trick itself into healing, it can trick itself into hurting. All of, again, the slightest provocation. And where that applies to cursed objects, and I'm not, this, is, this has been done by anthropologists, is with um, zombie death, right? So down in the Caribbean where, you know, this, this, this concept of zombieism is a real thing where people will act like they're dead. They will be listless. They'll lose their appetites. They'll just wander. They won't communicate because they think they've been cursed and are zombies, basically. So their mind has tricked them into buying this line of uh, that somebody has given them that they're a zombie. So what that means is if you believe something is cursed, it can be cursed. That's all it takes. Like if I convince myself that that dog behind me, or I guess it's beside me now, that, that bronze dog is cursed, then I can find myself in a string of bad luck and misfortune really easily. Some of that is you're picking it out, you know, whatever, you, you pick any seven days of your life, you can pick out all the good things or pick out all the bad things, but you can really, your, your body can trick you, it's physiological because it's, physiological it's your brain, your body can trick you into thinking you're cursed, which means you will just draw bad stuff to you. And again, it's, the more you explain it, the more you sound metaphysical, <laughs> but it really is a, a scientific precept. You can just cause yourself harm. Or, or like be open to harm and it, it just, it, it'll just, it'll happen. So if that's true, then cursed objects are real. You know, they're not cursed in the sense that they were cursed by um, a witch doctor or they weren't cursed by some kind of metaphysical thing. Your body just tricked itself into harming itself or to being open to harm because you, you know, convince yourself that you're in the presence of a cursed object. So that's scary because I don't know how that works. I don't know how like to avoid that. Like I, I have the feeling if you tried hard enough, any, any skeptic, anybody, tried hard enough to think that, to convince them of being cursed, they could do it really, really easy. That's why I kind of believe in cursed objects now, because it's a completely human phenomenon that makes sense to me. You know, at the end of the day, even though you can't understand it, it makes a sense to me. And you see it all the time, you know, there's always people, you know, who seems like the worst things always happen to them because they're always talking about the worst things. They have a mindset where they think that at all times, bad things will happen to them. Everybody's out to get them. Nothing ever goes right for them. They have the worst luck of all. And they really, I don't, I'm not gonna say the word manifest, but they really make that happen um, just by power of that's what, that seems to be what, what they're about. So it's a phenomenon that I think legitimizes cursed objects uh, in a real way. It's the deterioration of the human condition. Yes, yes. You can always, you can always count on a bad thing happening to you. <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's like an immutable law of Newton physics. Right. Um, I only have one more thing, and that's, I think it's your latest book. The Smashed Man of Dread End is probably my favorite book title ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny. Um, so I, what I always do is um, I always search my titles before they come out in public, or even before I write the book, really, just to see what's out there, make sure I'm not stealing anybody else's title, just to see what there is. And for that one, for Smash Man of Dread End, all I got was like pictures of drunken people. <laughs> this is what I got. <laughs> and that, that's it. That's it. So I was like, oh, okay, nobody's used this title, especially having used this title for a kid's book because <laughs> that's simply inappropriate. But yeah, that's my, um, so I write um, horror novels for kids as well. And I don't, I don't take it easy on them at all. I really love scaring kids. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I can only scare my own three so much. So now I've kind of tried to turn my career into being able to scare more kids. So the Smash Man is a monster in the basement story. But it's a monster that I, I it doesn't fit any of the tropes. It's not, you know, werewolf, ghost, vamp, all those things. It's, it's, it's something I tried to do something a little different with. And again, I tried not to pull any punches. I tried to make this thing as scary as possible. So hopefully that worked. Uh, another example is so my next kid's horror novel is called The Black Slide, which comes out next year. 
And um, I, that one I always pitch as Hellraiser for kids. But that one, when I search that title <laughs> online, all I get are images of black flip flops. <laughs> That's all there is online for the black slide. So we'll see if I can kind of own that title in the, in the search results next year. A Hellraiser for kids. That's a sentence I <laughs> so, never thought I'd hear. Yeah, it's not how I sold the book, mind you. <laughs> but right. that is how I pitched it to my agent and how I think about it. 